kick us off, to kick us off, we'll have the opportunity to learn a bit more about the region and the center of South a from South Asia from Dr. Sarah Beckham. Following this introduction, we will hear from Dr. Tara Allendorf, who will share some of her work with us. We will move from there to Ms. Sweta Shrista to learn about a study abroad opportunity in the region. I will introduce each speaker prior to their talk and will allow time for questions following each speaker. But please feel free to put questions in the chat at any time. Following the speakers, we'll have an opportunity to hear about a variety of ways to get involved in South Asia. This information and other materials from today's conversation will be emailed to participants. Please note the session is being recorded. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Dr. Sarah Beckham. Dr. Beckham is the Associate Director of the Center for South Asia and Academic Director of the South Asia Summer Language Institute and the South Asia Flagship Language Initiative. Her work focuses on sound systems of South Asian languages with specialization in contact linguistics and loan word phonology in Marathi. She is also a co-founding member of the Punjabi Bolian Research Initiative, which documents language change and dialect leveling in post-partition Punjabi. She currently teaches language and identity in South Asia and Introduction to Eco-Linguistics at UW-Madison. Without further ado, I turn it over to Sarah. Great, um, thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. Can you hear me? Great, okay. Um, I'll just do a brief uh, snapshot of South Asia as it relates to the different um, themes that the other speakers are going to talk about. Uh, and I just wanna give everybody kind of a quick overview of the connection um, to South Asian studies here at UW-Madison. Sanskrit was actually taught at UW-Madison beginning in the 1880s in what was then uh, the Department of Ancient Languages. And then later um, Indian classics were taught in translation, of course, in the Department of Comp Lit around the turn of the century. And in the Cold War era, an Indian studies department was established here in the 1950s following faculty participation in these um, federally funded technical assistance programs in India. Oops, went too fast. Oh, sorry about that. My mouse is, um, has a brain of its own. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the South Asia Center was created in the 60s, also federally funded, and that merged with uh, the South Asia Studies Department, which was renamed. Memorial Library also has an interesting history with uh, Soviet era, uh, Cold War era, funding and the uh, Memorial Library was a recipient of the Library of Congress's PL40, which was a wheat exchange program for books from India and this positioned Memorial Library to be a world class research institution for South Asian studies. And then of course, um, College Year in India was the very first US study abroad program in, in India that was established by UW Madison in 1960 and went on to become the College Year in India and Nepal and is very much a legacy of the Joe Elder family. And now the South Asian studies program resides in ALC, the department, and then our Title VI funded center has um, been, uh, is, is separated and is administered um, apart from the department. And we administer and facilitate the South Asia Summer Language Institute and the annual conference on South Asia. So UW-Madison has a very long history um, in South Asian studies. So South Asia, where is it? What is it? Um, it's important because one in four people in the world live in South Asia. So I've um, listed the countries here that constitute South Asia as a geographic and kind of cultural entity with the populations. We have India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, the Maldives, and Bhutan. South Asia is a very linguistically and culturally diverse area. There are 
six language families spoken in South Asia, and the two dominant language families are listed under the major language families. We have the Indo-Aryan, uh, Indo-European languages, and then the Dravidian languages. But interestingly, um, those language families have the smallest number of languages in those families. So the larger number of languages numerically are actually um, located in the smaller branches. <clears throat> English, uh, because of the colonial legacy, is spoken widely across South Asia, especially among elites, and it makes the region relatively accessible to Westerners. So some major historical timelines, um, you know, following the Indus uh, civilization, there are a number of expansive empires which effectively created through the exchange of cultures and languages and commodities, something of a cohesive material culture that we can call South Asia. And this extended all the way through British rule. And then of course we have the independent states in, post, in the post-colonial era. So the state of democracy in these different countries. Um, India was uh, once considered the world's uh, largest and most vibrant democracy. It, um, and it's very unique compared to the US in that India had universal suffrage from its inception, as well as constitutional protections for um, historically oppressed people. But uh, the parliamentary democracy has recently been downgraded to an electoral autocracy, and it's slipped in the democracy index due to attacks on journalists, as well as a decline in civil liberties under Modi's BJP government, which, um, so it's been a, a recent sort of eight year downward trend. Um, Pakistan is also listed as a flawed democracy by the democracy index following decades of de facto military rule and military coups of civilian governments. Um, the war in Sri Lanka ended in 2009, the civil war, but a constitutional crisis has since followed. So again, the, um, as a democracy, it's fairly young. And uh, for those who, of course, are interested in the Maldives, um, the former Maldives president and climate activist Mohamed Nasheed was ousted in 2012, but uh, op opposition-led efforts uh, since have made some relatively modest advances since 2018. And then in Nepal, following a civil war which ended in 2006, Nepal abolished its monarchy and it became a very young representative democracy since 2008. Um, and of course, most of you know, Afghanistan is currently under Taliban military rule following the withdrawal of US troops uh, last fall. Bangladesh, which was formerly East Pakistan, got its independence from West Pakistan in 1971. And military rule ended there in 1990 following protests. But since uh, the country has seen somewhat of a backslide in democracy, uh, when in 2014, the ruling party did away with established election protections and Bhutan is still a constitutional monarchy. So with respect to development in this area, um, India is really the largest economy in the region and it's one of the world's largest economies. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world at 7.97% in 2021, which was really um, not too much of a, of a decrease given uh, everything that happened in the pandemic. It has a consumer middle class that's larger than the total size of the US population. And uh, following the white revolution in the 1970s, it's also one of the largest exporters of milk. Uh, it's very difficult for development economists to measure, but South Asia's service exports are actually growing immensely, and that includes telecommunications, software, and IT. Um, however, unfortunately, the pandemic-related inflation that uh, we're all seeing across the globe has forced up to an estimated 60 million people in South Asia into poverty. The Green Revolution was also uh, a very important uh, time in India's history. This is when India industrialized its agricultural sector in the 1960s. And this led to a pretty significant increase in food production, but also um, alongside this lasting environmental damage. Uh, then following that, the liberalization of India's economy in the 1990s under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh introduced multinational corporations such as Monsanto into the agricultural sector, but the debts incurred by farmers in these new um, practices and agricultural products like the Roundup Ready have driven uh, quite a 
substantial increase in farmer suicides. And for those who followed um, the Indian farmers protest movements in the, in the recent year in 2020 and 21, successfully re repealed some farm bills that were put forth under the current Modi administration. So um, these agricultural and industrial developments in South Asia have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but at the same time, they've resulted in devastating environmental damage. Um, for most people who live in an urban environment, that includes particulate matter, smog, air pollution, extreme heat is another thing um, which impacts uh, public health. Um, environmental disasters, and then we see, of course, the relationship between deforestation and displacement in urbanization, as well as desertification and the degradation of land and water. And of course, climate change, as it does all over the globe, um, impacts the most vulnerable communities in South Asia and has uh, created a growing number of displaced people and climate refugees. And I believe the projected number by 2050 is uh, supposed to be around 40 million internally displaced climate refugees within South Asia. So the relationship between displacement, cultural dislocation, and um, the um, loss of biodiversity. In ecolinguistics, uh, we, we see that there is a relationship between the loss of biodiversity and linguistic or cultural uh, diversity, which is also called biocultural diversity. Um, when we see a reduction in linguistic diversity that trends toward monolingualism, the same dangers are present um, as uh, you know when monocultures prevail over sustaining biodiversity. And part of the reason for that is because um, rich ecological knowledge about it, a local eco region is actually acquired for over centuries, sometimes millennia. And this, uh, this knowledge is used to sustain biodiversity and to sustain human life. And that's encoded linguistically. And so when the languages and cultures of the people who have that knowledge are destroyed uh, because of displacement, either from land development, resource extraction, climate change, many other things, that knowledge is lost as well. So an example of how that um, can impact what's happening uh, in South Asia. Um, most of that knowledge is encoded in many of South Asia's small tribal languages. And those languages are under major threat right now. Language shift is something that we're seeing occurring at unprecedented rates because of globalization, because of development, contact-induced cultural changes. And that results in uh, the stigmatization or the de-incentivization of tribal languages. There's no economic incentive for speakers um, to maintain them. And uh, these communities, when they're displaced, often shift to the dominant language of the elites. In India, for example, um, out of 96 languages which are unscheduled, they're not federally protected, 90 of them are tribal languages. And as we've seen over the last couple of decades, MOUs between mining companies and Indian provinces are displacing these tribal communities in very large numbers. And 43% um, of Nepal's languages are actually tribal languages, but most of them are endangered because they're um, they're not incentivized. And so we're seeing major language shifts alongside loss of biodiversity in these areas. And then of course, conservation projects can also have unintended consequences. Um, in Sri Lanka, the national conservation projects have actually forced the indigenous Vedas off of their ancestral hunting areas and have destroyed their um, traditional forms of livelihood that lead to a surge in displacement and then, a, and then a loss of this cultural and linguistic knowledge. So with that kind of brief snapshot in mind, I wanna then hand it back over to Jennifer for the introduction of speakers so we can hear about um, community-based conservation and um, the impacts of public health. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, really interesting. Um, so our next guest is Dr. Terry Ellendorf. Terry has worked on issues of local communities and conservation since 1994. She earned her PhD in conservation biology at the University of Minnesota and has substantial experience with conservation policy and community level programs. She was a member of USAID's biodiversity team, a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal, and has partnered with NGOs and communities on conservation issues in Nepal, Myanmar, China, and India. 
She has published numerous peer-reviewed journals, articles in journals and taught courses at the University of Minnesota, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Future Generations University, as well as short courses in India and Namibia. She also consulted on biodiversity projects for USAID in Tanzania, Mozambique, Uganda, Nepal, Guatemala, and Guyana. Without further ado, Terry, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen here and thanks for inviting me today. There. Okay, sorry. Now, can, am I unmuted now? <laughs> I think I kept saying I'm muted. Are we good? We're good. Okay. Go, go for it. I got to get to the first slide. I wasn't even on the first slide. Ah. How come I can't, can't move my slides? Here we go. Okay, it's just slow. Sorry, everybody. Okay, I'm going to be talking about community conservation, primarily in, in Nepal. I've worked in um, a little bit less in India and then worked across the Himalayan region and some of the countries too, just looking from a policy level. But I'm primarily going to talk about my work in Nepal today. Um, so my background, I basically, so I was Peace Corps in Nepal, that's what first took me to South Asia, and Nepal is addictive, and I think it's one of the countries where the most number of return Peace Corps volunteers keep going back to or keep working. It's a pretty uh, memorable country once you've been there, and, um, and I kept going back, so, and I've worn many hats there. One is a research hat, um, getting my, you know, doing dissertation research there. I'm, the primary thing that motivates is looking at people's perceptions of protected areas and biodiversity and what local communities think, and what motivates them. Uh, and then I've also expanded that to looking just at community knowledge about biodiversity and community involvement in monitoring and management. Uh, and then looking at um, communities and conservation policy, so sort of across, you know, from the, the bottom to the top, trying to understand conservation in local communities. And then my consulting hat, working with USAID, WWF, a lot of the, the, the major Nepal biodiversity projects like the Dry Arc Landscape, the Hario Bun, helped do some pre-design for the newest biodiversity project that USAID is gonna be funding. Um, it worked on governance and livelihood issues on, on those consultancies too. So that, that also has really expanded my vision outside of you know, just biodiversity and, and communities. And then more recently, I became the executive director of community conservation, which is based here in Wisconsin, has been around since the 1980s. And that a lot of the projects I was sort of doing on the ground have now come under the umbrella of CC. So today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, those projects too, since that's the active work that I'm doing in Nepal now. Um, so Nepal is, is, is a success story in conservation. So it's sort of gonna, Gonna make a lot of, you know, Sarah's sort of painting. There is a bleak picture, picture. There's definitely a glass half full. But if you look at South Asia, if there's if there's a glass, um, sorry, so there's definitely a glass half full, half empty. But if you look at Nepal, there's a there's a glass half full going on there. In the 1970s, there's the Himalayan degradation theory, which predicted that Nepal was going to lose all of its forests by 2000. It was going to lose all of its rhinos and tigers by the 1980s. And what we've actually seen is more forest with community forestry and the protected areas. The forests have actually gone up from like 25% to 45% across the country. You have rhino population that is doing so well, they've been able to translocate for years between national parks. And they've also had basically zero poaching. We, you know, there's, <laughs> that may be arguable, but you know, they will claim zero poaching. And, and so very little poaching of like rhinos for a long time. Tigers are, it's gonna be one of the countries that reaches that doubling of the tiger population by 2022. And you've got over 30% households participating in the rural areas and community forest, which is protecting about a third of Nepal's forest. There's another third in protected areas and another third um, being managed by the government. So it is, it's a success story compared to almost anything we thought could have happened there. And how did they do this? Well, they did it with policies that came from the, the top down that really promoted community forestry, uh, protected area buffer zones where 30 to 50% of protected area funds go to buffer zone activities. And then areas like the conserva Annapurna Conservation Area, which a lot of people have heard of, which allowed people to stay living in the protected area. They were not resettled outside. Those areas are mainly up in the mountains. Um, so Nepal had some great policies and they had from the ground up local people that were supporting conservation, which is what I said, that's the primary thing that motivates me in my, in my research and then the associated projects are local communities and their motivations and the reasons they participate. And they're really what has driven a lot of the success in Nepal 
with the policies that sort of allowed it to happen and facilitated them doing the hard work. Um, so this research I've done in a number of countries looking at perceptions and the lessons are kind of universal. Um, and we certainly see these in Nepal that, that people generally have even local communities that rely on protected areas and may have lost traditional access still have generally positive attitudes. Majorities of people will say they like a protected area and they see specific benefits. And for a lot of people attitude, their positive attitude will be predicted by them knowing that there are and believing there are conservation and ecosystem service benefits, right? Like they say that the benefit of a protected area is it is protecting wildlife. That's important to us. We want wildlife protected or we are getting cleaner water or cleaner air. Our agriculture is better because we live near a protected area. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there that sort of goes into the complexity of the relationship. Yes, there are problems. There's wildlife that eat your crops. There are, you know, and animals that can kill you or your family. There are a lot of conflict issues, which can be problematic, but basically people want to conserve the environment, right? They do want to have that healthy environment around them. And a key variable there is just knowledge. It's people, the people who understand why a protected area is there, um, who know more about the reasons it's there and when it was created, they tend to be the ones that see those types of benefits. And communities are not hom homogeneous. So there's also things that are associated with it, like, like gender. So which I've done a lot of work on looking at gender and perceptions. And so for, this is just one example. You can do this with you know, educated versus less educated or whatever socioeconomic demographic variables. But with women, you know, my research has shown that they tend to be, they do tend to be more negative uh, it's, and it's because they lack information, right? So actually in Nepal, women tend to be, to be more positive than men, even though they have less information. You can see they have less information. They have less understanding of all the ecosystem service benefits, but they're still very positive. Partly because in Nepal, they just have such a history and a tradition at this point of protecting biodiversity that everyone sort of you know, knows it and talks about it. Uh, so even women who have less access to information in Nepal know, know all this stuff a lot better than, for example, comparing it to the same study I've done in Myanmar, where women are really isolated compared to men. They don't have access to information about all this stuff. Um, but women have less access, right, because of time, labor, cultural constraints. They're not as educated. They don't go to public school as long. They don't have as much time to go to meetings. They often can't go to meetings if their husband won't let them or their mother-in-law. So that those can be problematic. And if they don't have access to meetings about, you know, they don't, then they don't know why the protected area is there. Who is benefiting from it? How is it managed? What are the rules and regulations around it? Um, but but the, to me, what's interesting too, is that these sort of gender patterns are ones we can see even in the US. If you look at developed countries, even here, you see that women here tend to know less about the environment and ecology and wildlife. It tends to be a, more of a male dominated area. Women are less likely to participate in environmental activities outside the home, just like in Nepal, uh, and less involved in wildlife conservation. So like hunting is a good example in the US, right? Where it's sort of stereotypically male. So a lot of those same patterns are happening in, in Nepal and Myanmar and other countries. So that's just some of the some baseline of uh, some of the perceptions work I've done. And there's, there's other research that I'm not gonna go into looking at policies and stuff today, but happy to answer questions or at a later date. Uh, I was just gonna describe the, uh, uh, the three projects that are ongoing right now in Nepal. So I just came back from six weeks and got to work on actually all three of these. I got to visit all three sites. Um, so it's pretty fresh and up-to-date information that I have on them all of what we're doing. So we have a community wildlife corridor that we're working to develop down in the southeast of Nepal. Um, and so we're working with community forest user groups. So all along this strip of Nepal, all this forest, there are a lot of community forestry groups that are working in there to conserve their own forests. Uh, and they mainly focus on trees, timber, non-timber forest products. Uh, and we're trying to help build their capacity to manage for wildlife, to do camera trapping, to keep track of what's in their forests, what species, um, and so we've done both a survey of community forests across this whole landscape, looking at what, what species they think they have. And then now we're sort of working from east to west, actually training on the ground community forest groups to start uh, camera trapping. And hopefully from that, building their capacity to monitor wildlife for themselves, and then work across community forest groups to create a network sort of looking, because ultimately you could have, for example, right now tigers are mainly in the western part of Nepal, uh, but they could be in the east, right? If this forest was regenerated enough, it is improving, but it's still far more degraded than some other parts of Nepal. Uh, so that's the, the purpose there is just sort of to build up this wildlife corridor with a wildlife focus um, with the communities. 
And then recently started a project with a student in forest and wildlife ecology, Sam Helley, looking at um, to the west of what I was just showing you, which is the eastern part of Nepal. This is looking in um, west of Chitwan National Park. Uh, and there's a bottleneck there because there's a city and a river and tigers can't get across there. And they've seen tigers come, come right up from over on the west side and the east side come right up to this, this bottleneck. Um, but they, they can't, it looks like they're not crossing. So she wants to start a project to, to get tiger scat, do some genetic work, see if any of these tigers are actually crossing from one side to the other uh, and showing the populations mixing. And she also wants to work with the community forest groups to start to have them do the monitoring, collecting the scat, doing the camera trapping, looking for themselves to see where tigers are and, and you know, what other species are also there like tiger prey, um, you know, looking at deer and, and other species in the community forest. So that's just starting. She was just doing an initial foray and she'll go back as a full writer next year and spend a year there uh, working on this for her, for her first research um, session. And then the third project is down in Lumbini, which is the birthplace of Buddha, which is sort of just south of where the SAMS project is in central Nepal with Tiger. And this is the International Crane Foundation has been renting, uh, leasing a part of the Lumbini's Lumbini Buddha's birthplace area, the northern section has SARS crane. So they have been leasing this area since the 1980s and doing lots of sort of a lot of things to protect it, to, to help develop it. Uh, but they're at a point now where they really want to have some sort of education and outreach, uh, cohesive vision for the area to move it forward. So in partnership with ICF and WWF Nepal, uh, I'm going there to help see if we can come up with some sort of vision and plan that then we could start putting into action and bringing all these diverse activities they've been, been doing into one, which would try and link the birthplace of Buddha with conservation. You know, the Saras crane is a symbolic species for Buddhists. Um, and it's interesting because Lumbini, majority of people around this area, the local communities, some of which were displaced to create this area are Muslim. So you've got an area with like 60% Muslim migrants from the hills of Nepal and some other some, you know, some other indigenous groups there, uh, and very few Buddhists, less than 5% are actually Buddhists living in this area. So it's sort of an interesting project and thinking about how can you both reach communities, but also reach, you know, the broader world, because so many tourists are coming there from around the world each year. Um, and that is the end. So I'm happy to take any questions or explain anything more. That was pretty quick. Thank you so much, Terry. This is uh, really interesting. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions now and i'm going to just look in the chat um and if not we'll have hopefully a little time at the end too so let me just see uh if there are any questions okay i'm not seeing any at the moment so let's um let's keep moving and um please feel free to drop questions in the chat now we'll uh, like i said hopefully have time to pick them up later and also um you will we'll have contact information. So if you wanna follow up with any of the speakers uh, after today's conversation, um, that should be no problem. So thanks again, Terry. For those of you uh, now interested in hearing about ways to get involved yourself, uh, Ms. Sueta Shritha will introduce us to a field experience opportunity for students. Sueta is the Workforce Training Program's lead for the Mobilizing Action Toward Community Health Group at the Population Health Institute. She manages the Population Health Service Fellowship Program, the COVID-19 Response Corps Program, and provides leadership and guidance on public health workforce training and development efforts at PHI. She has extensive experience leading community engagement and outreach efforts around the world and brings the global perspective into her role. She earned her master's in public health and graduate global health certificate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health, focusing on global health and bioethics. Sueta has led the undergraduate field course in Nepal focused on community health and health disparities for over eight years. In April, Sueta will be stepping into the associate director of the Master of Public Health program at UW-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. Without further ado, Sweta, I'm gonna turn it over to you to <clears throat> entice people with this opportunity. Thank you. 
let's see, I will share this and keeping it, uh, can you all see my uh, presenter view? Yes, great. Thank you, Sarah, for the thumbs up. Um, and happy to take questions or keep it as informal as possible. Um, and I am going to really talk about what the undergraduate certificate in global health and other ways in which we've been trying to uh, change a practice on how we do public health and global health through the engagement work that um, well, I've been able to do in Nepal. And um, let me see if I can. And I like to start and on the work on why why I'm here and what really shapes me is I was born and raised in Nepal. So a lot of the places that Terry talked about are my home. These are my these are members of my family. I I spend as much time in Chitwan among the rhinos because uh, I have family members who worked in conservation as any uh, as anything else. This is a picture of me and my sister growing up in Nepal in the 80s being really cool, I think, I thought, um, and that shapes me that um, um, I'm the different identities that I hold as a first generation immigrant, female, a person able bodied, uh, having had access to higher education, being multilingual, um, have growing up in a two parent household having citizenship um, and a lot of passing privileges uh, gives me some advantages and disadvantages depending on where I am. So really digging into the nuances of power and privileges and the disadvantages and barriers has been uh, where my work has come to. And then um, I know that I am shaped by the ripples that were created and, the generations before me, some of the uh, work that Sarah mentioned on the on strategies around USAID that began before USAID was called USAID really shaped my family history. So thinking about those ripples and how it shaped choices that I have and um, areas I have access to, I think about that as I think about the ripples I want to create and what the social and political determinants of health look like for folks, um, and especially for um, communities um, of color around the world. So, um, and going back to what shaped me, the picture on the right is Bandipur, which um, Terry will be very familiar with, is one of my uh, favorite places in Nepal in the hills. Um, both my parents come from this village. Um, and, um, in the 50s and 60s, my grandfather um, had the opportunity because of multiple government uh, strategies on, er on malaria eradication to move to Chitwan area and really start um, um, being an entrepreneur. So, um, you know, the geopolitical infrastructures and the border policies and these programs and that really influenced who I am and my trajectory. I think about what that means. And I also think about as folks are not now leaving rural spaces, what the opportunities could have looked like if there were things that would have allowed him to stay, would have allowed him to thrive and what was missed. Um, so I think that's uh, when we think about development and what it is and what it isn't really thinking about the nuances of not only the future, but what it could be has been important in some of the work that I'm doing. The picture on the right is a, a, a snapshot of where we are in Kathmandu. This was now, all my pictures are a few years old. It's been a minute since I've been able to go back and really thinking about what development has looked like and what when I was growing up in Nepal, uh, Kathmandu looked drastically different. There were lots of rice paddies. It was much more green um, uh, to say the least. So as it has rapidly developed, um, uh, what has been lost and how do we kind of recreate communities that were uh, more intrinsic in the way people organize themselves. So, um, and that really brought me to thinking about the social determinants of health, which in the, um, in the early, um, I want to say 1800s, it's not, um, in the 2000s, uh, 
the, the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health really uh, called for um, uh, academic institutions to, uh, on their role in measuring and understanding um, the problems of social determinants of health on, uh, internationally and our um, and called for um, academic institutions to build capacity on measuring and understanding the problems that really centers communities most impacted and assess the impact of actions and inaction too. So I think that really created a setup for me to be able to uh, work you know, on the undergraduate certificate in global health now over 10 years ago. And um, my role at that point was really to expand the knowledge of social determinants of, uh, of health in the global context, influence stakeholders on the need for global health education um, in UW, um, and, um, and think about how do we secure uh, resources and capital to implement these programs worldwide. And for me specifically thinking about how do I work on a program that changes how folks talk about communities and especially my family, that it wasn't this Western versus South and we're going to like perpetuating the, uh, the savior mentality of having to same and what was coded as really save these communities of color who couldn't do it themselves. So working with students to understand where global health is and what the future looks like that centers um, communities and really um, the voices and provides a more truer picture of what, uh, what was happening. So a fundamental part of the undergraduate certificate was field experiences and as I was uh, in many ways tasked to think about the field courses, oftentimes I think about what not to do. And for me, it was important, and especially when I'm taking folks to Bandipur, where one of the houses we visit is literally the house that my mom was born in. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I was done well, so that it was uh, that the vault, it was not a tourist experience. It was not medical tourism. It wasn't observing a people suffering and and creating a one-sided, one-dimensional story and perpetuating uh, stereotypes in the narrative around what third world nations are and, um, and thinking about culture as being only one way. So um, really uh, the goal was to create field courses that changes how students learn and their view of the world, especially around the global south. I had the privilege of making the Nepal field course that I'll dig into a little bit more and also work with Sumudu and other folks and other field courses, um, including Sri Lanka. So, um, and the field course is one part of a larger uh, portfolio um, to uh, teach undergraduate students around global health. So for me, the experiential learning is really around elevating the voices and the lives of communities, um, helping folks see the social, political, and cultural determinants of health in practice. Um, so a lot of the things that Terry talked about, there are nuanced and communities uh, care a lot about what happens and, and um, are really smart and making complex decisions for their families and their communities. So being able to elevate that, it's been a privilege and I and still, um, try to improve it every time we do the field course. So in the end, the outcome I'm working towards is mitigating harm and extractive practices that we don't come back by just taking from uh, stories and experiences that we are, we are really learning and growing as students and learn and lifelong learners and moving towards this idea of decolonizing global health. What does it mean if the narrative and the stories and the experience is controlled um, and determined by folks who live, live it in a daily basis? Um, so this apologies for <laughs> um, the, uh, the text heavy slide, but this is, um, just really thinking about our objectives of the course to increase the students' knowledge and understanding about health and well being in, in villages, uh, how health and well being is impacted by these larger uh, determinants of health, 
and um, and what does it mean to be in uh, to honor diversity and cross cultural understanding and be in spaces that don't always um, make uh, folks comfortable and might like really throw them off kilter. Um, and uh, in the end, I want students to be able to come back and and also compare. There are lots of really smart people in Nepal and other countries doing amazing work. Um, so how do we learn and how do we then apply it to our communities here too? Um, um, I think it's uh, always interesting uh, to see how folks have either leapfrog technology or being able to do some really innovative work that often um, uh, gets uh, sidelines for uh, more flashier things. So the field course is in general broken into three different parts. Um, the first part, it's a three week field course over um, that happens in the end of May and June. Uh, we do um, a lot of site visits in Kathmandu for a week. Um, the folks get to visit lots of organizations uh, that are working on a vast variety of topics around um, health. So anything from conservation to uh, reproductive health to more clinical um, uh, health. And we are pretty intentional that all these organizations are led by Nepali people, because I think uh, um, elevating um, communities and the folks working in country is, um, is a, a center to our field course. And the field course is also led by me and my uh, partner in Nepal, uh, who is a UW alum as well, um, that um, folks are able to see um, folks of color in leadership spaces. And um, we do a lot of uh, didactic, but also reflection. So thinking about, you know, how do we really learn from, uh, from folks and have conversations about what they are struggling with, uh, what, uh, what they're excited about. And then um, part of the field course is students uh, get to be in villages and work with the community on a project that the community themselves determine. I think um, there's been a long history of folks coming in with uh, predetermined projects, uh, long-term, short-term. So we, uh, because of the long-term relationships, people let us know what they want to work on and how, and students learn a lot by working alongside um, folks from the villages, from the moms, the, the kids, the dads, and um, get to know each other in a more human level. Um, and then the last part um, is uh, do a couple days hike in the foothills of the Himalayas and be able to really learn about access and what conservation does look like in an area that is really climate sensitive. So again, um, the field course is all about making connections with people, problems, thinking about what power and privilege means. Um, as it is true here in the US is if you have access, if you have um, um, land, money, and uh, uh, the right connections, um, your life looks drastically different than folks who don't. So really being able and cast is uh, central to how that is kind of operationalized. So really being able to grasp that and also see that in the US and how that is kind of manifested. Um, so lots of uh, reflection happens in the field course that some are guided, some are um, individuals, but in the end it is about this learning and unlearning together that students do. I think that is what has made uh, the field course successful and really push students out of their comfort zones um, around um, reflection, around um, grounded in place-based knowledge and working towards cultural competency and cultural humility. Um, uh, to date, um, as was mentioned, um, we've done this field course over, um, for over eight years and we're growing. Over 105 students have graduated from the field course and has led to um, a lot of other partnerships and opportunities. And a great thing is also that this uh, model has been replicated in other countries. Um, one of the coolest things have been really able to see the work with Dooney Kill Hospital um, and Kathmandu University around QI work that really was uh, 
founded on these ongoing relationships. We've had placements of medical students and PH students in different organizations and um, being able to be there and learn what the needs are and how um, we and UW can help without again further extracting and that we're actually providing service that is needed and also not taking us space that could be occupied by someone with the expertise there um, and uh, really had the opportunity to kind of again over the years uh, do a lot of reflection um, uh, repair work um, and reassessing um, I think there's the earthquake being one opportunity and recently really um, doing that with COVID too. Uh, we um, decided not to uh, turn our field course virtual last year because our partners in Nepal felt that that was too straining on them. So again, respecting what they had capacity for and, um, and not. So as we move forward, we are going this year and really appreciate the IAP team uh, making this happen. Our curriculum will absolutely focus on COVID-19 response and recovery, thinking about what was done uh, regionally, nationally, and how that uh, all manifested in the global response. Um, think about who had access and not. I think uh, as with the US, inequities became really apparent and how inequities uh, impact people's health directly. Um, so being able to take the things that I'm doing right now around COVID response in Wisconsin and really um, uh, juxtaposition that against some of the things that are happening in Nepal. Um, in the end, the health and safety of our communities, uh, especially communities that, are, that don't have the same access to health uh, to um, medicine in the same way or vaccines are paramount. So uh, we are uh, taking our COVID-19 precautions really seriously to make sure that we don't do undue harm in any way to our, the communities that we'll be visiting. So we're rethinking how we wanna do homestays. We used to stay with, uh, every uh, student would stay with a family. Um, we're rethinking, um, and doing and what are ways in which we can still have that same level of engagement without the homestay? Um, what does partnership and service look like when folks are tired, when folks uh, might not have the same bandwidth? So being respectful in that uh, engagement and in the end, uh, centering the voices of the communities most impacted that are even in Nepal kind of tend to get lost in the voices of the folks that are well educated and elite and are make in the and have power. So and none of this work before I end could be possible without the some of the folks in this picture. Robin Mithenthal was a central part of undergraduate uh, field course uh, undergraduate certificate team and really um, has left a large impact on uh, approaching all of our field course with compassion and care. And then uh, the picture on the left is uh, he was one of our tour guides, our guide, not tour guides, our guides for our hikes. Um, and he passed away with code because of COVID this past year. And um, I think we will certainly feel, feel his absence. And I think one of the things that we haven't uh, fully grasped in COVID is the ripples of people lost and communities, um, not just the folks, uh, not just the, you know, the numbers that we see. So um, really bringing those both those um, larger than life people into the field course in many different ways. So that is all I had. Thank you for the time. And my email is right there. Feel free to, I was gonna say text, but email is what I meant uh, with any questions um, for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sweta. That was um, really inspirational. Um, just lots of really great things for us to think about um, and engage with. Um, I'd like to suggest that we maybe uh, hold off on any questions. I haven't looked at the chat yet. Um, I want to move um, to talking through and sharing several different types of opportunities 
And um, I think we will have time uh, maybe for a couple of questions uh, before we need to wrap up, but we will share um, contact information again. So um, everybody um, in the conversation today can feel free to follow up directly with any of the speakers. Um, so opportunities, I'm, I'm, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be sharing some kind of categories of opportunities, different ways to get involved. I won't be talking through specifically each opportunity, but again, please know we'll be sending out um, a copy of the slides um, to everybody who has registered for this conversation. So you'll have all this, you'll have the links. Um, so and, and as we go through, you'll see some of the uh, some of the opportunities are in green and some are in black. The ones that are in green are ones that um, might be of particular interest to students. The ones that are in black might be to faculty, staff, postdocs, grad students, and others. So um, volunteer opportunities. There are a wide range of ways to get involved um, as a, as a volunteer, typically as a volunteer, um, one's um, travel, living expenses, and sometimes a small stipend are covered as part of the program. They're usually focused around a particular geography um, and also a particular um, type of work, type of engagement, maybe environmental or um, health, et cetera. The Farmer to Farmer program uh, offers short term, shorter term opportunities, usually two to four weeks is sort of the average. Um, whereas Peace Corps are usually longer opportunities. Um, the typical Peace Corps assignment is two years, although there's some other variations of that as well. But um, please take a, a look at some of these. Again, some are shorter terms, some are longer term. Grants. Um, there are a range of grants available to support work in this region. And I will just call your attention to the uh, GARDEN grant, the Global Agricultural Research Development Network grant for faculty and staff and postdocs. Uh, this is a grant that is a, a seed grant. It's intended to catalyze um, new international collaborations. It's run out of our office. Um, the deadline is coming up uh, this next week, um, but please do check that one out. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, we've got um, some additional opportunities for faculty and staff, um, ways to engage, get engaged through the Center for South Asia and the affiliates group, as well as through our office here in Cal's Global. Fellowship opportunities usually support um, a, a extended period of time um, studying or working um, in another country. These are some of the fellowship opportunities, again, available for students and also for faculty, staff, postdocs, and graduate students. Um, and they also range uh, in, in terms of time, duration, and focus. Next slide. Study abroad, um, we had the opportunity to hear um, from Sueta one of the field courses. There are uh, other uh, study abroad and field type experiences for students. So please do check these out, out as well. That first one um, we heard about, and there's an additional one there linked to um, the program in Sri Lanka. As well, there are courses that focus on um, different issues relevant to this uh, and, and uh, aspects of this region of South Asia. So those are the, the courses that you might want to check out. And the Summer Language Institute, South Asia Summer Language Institute is another opportunity. Next slide. Um, MOUs, which are memorandums of understanding, but those are really our broad agreements between uh, the UW and uh, partners, international partners like other universities, um, ministries of health, environment, or agriculture. These are some of the MOUs that uh, currently exist um, between UW um, or CALS and um, international partners in the region. It can be helpful to know where who those partners are, um, can help make connections, 
um, and help uh, bring, we can help uh, bring people together. Next slide. This is a continuation here of the MOUs. And then last slide, uh, we have some events coming up. Um, some of these are uh, offered through the Center for South Asia. Some of them are through CALS, um, other uh, co-sponsored events, um, a whole variety of things just coming up actually in the next few weeks. Um, and then that we just have some other ways if you want to just um, hear about what's going on, there are conferences um, and um, the, the Scholar Rescue Fund is a, a, an interesting uh, program that was recently brought to our attention. Uh, the contacts for our um, distingu distinguished guests today are on the slide here. Um, again, you'll be getting this, but please do feel free to follow up directly uh, with anybody uh, to continue the conversation. Um, we're really grateful uh, for everybody for being here. Um, maybe before we uh, wrap up uh, with a, a teaser for our next conversation, I just want to check and see if there are any questions here in the chat um, anybody would like to uh, ask one of our speakers before we uh, sign off here. All right, not seeing anything, so that's great. Um, well, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please do uh, stay tuned for next month. Um, the conversation will be focused on Africa. Uh, the date is April 13th, again, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, we will be following up uh, with some additional information on the speakers and format. You'll also be able to find that on our CALS Global website. And uh, again, thank you for being here with us. Um, and thank you to our speakers and our co-sponsors. Take good care.